us. Um, Today we're going to be talking first about the Reformation, and this is referring to Europe, and this was kind of a time between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. I'll go ahead and get that door. And so as we talk about the Reformation, this is an important change in the practice of Christianity in Europe. And so we're going to be spending the first part of this in particular talking about Christianity. So I wanted to start with a trailer here of a man named Martin Luther. And Martin Luther is important to not only the Lutheran faith, which is a denomination of Christianity, uh, but also important to anyone who would call themselves a Protestant, meaning a Christian who is not a Catholic. And so this scene, actually it's just a preview, we'll see some more scenes from this movie in just a moment, uh, showing kind of how important he is and what he did and how it affected the church. Size, But this is a very significant moment. And before we get into what this little monk did, to the most powerful institution in Europe at this time. We have to understand a little about Europe that would explain how he was able to do what he did. Uh, so first off, in the latter half of the century, uh, there were efforts to made, made to centralize the government in their respective states, in France, in Britain, well, it was called England then, uh, and then in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, this was concentrated around royal authority. Uh, in fact, one advisor to an Italian prince, Nicolai Machiavelli, wrote that absolute rulers need to abandon morality when making decisions that affect their empire. Issues of right and wrong are not relevant in politics, according to Nicolai Machiavelli in his famous book, The Prince. It's a pretty quick read and I actually recommend it. It's kind of scary when you read it and then realize this is required reading for anyone who goes into politics today. So, first a little about the prince. I just wanted to read a quote from it. It says, For the gap between how people actually behave and how they ought to behave is so great that anyone who ignores everyday reality in order to live up to an ideal will soon discover he had taught himself, he had been taught how to destroy himself. Now, the key there is the difference between the ideal, how we would hope to live, and of course, how we actually live. So the European economy was gradually recovering from the bubonic plague and from the dark ages in general. Uh, for France in particular, but also for many other countries, society was divided up into three estates. The first being the clergy, the second being the nobility, all in all, that represents about 1 to 2 percent of France's population, of each respective country's population. The third estate, and this is where we get the word third world come from, a uh, third world is from the peasants. However, the progress I just mentioned represents a growing middle class of merchants, of traders, of business people. But the third estate still represents 85 to 90 percent of the population. So you've got your two percent of extremely wealthy, first and third, first and second, and then you've got your middle class, small but growing, of people who have risen to a degree of prosperity, and then of course the third estate. Now, out of this middle class, this could mean any number of people. And this group was growing. They tended to be educated. So often they came from some degree of wealth, since education was privileged then. They tended to be entrepreneurial, French word, undertake. They tended to be risk takers, meaning that they were going into private enterprise, risking things for themselves. And one of these middle class entrepreneurs was a man named Johann Gutenberg first inventor of the printing press. Now, to be fair, he adapted a Chinese invention that was very old, the idea of movable type that had been around for quite some time. But he took this and made a press in which he could arrange all the little letters and blocks. And essentially, he made the first photocopier. Now, this may not sound like a big deal, 
But because of this, we went from monks copying books by hand, which took months and cost an extreme amount of money, to books being cheap. This man was voted by A&E historians around the turn of the millennia as the most influential man of the past millennia. He beat out Napoleon. Beat out FDR. He beat out William the Conqueror. He beat out George Washington. This little printer. One of the middle class. It's pretty amazing. Now, again, we're still in our background to the Reformation. So we've learned a little about the economy in terms of the first, second, third estate. And now let's learn a little about the philosophy, the ideas that were being tossed around at this time. First idea is Christian humanism. This was put forth by a man named Erat Decideris Erasmus. It's also known as the philosophy of Christ. It was the idea that Christianity was a personal relationship and that it should be a guiding philosophy for daily life, not simply a dogma of beliefs. Many of these same Christian humanists, led by men such as Erasmus, saw a great deal of corruption in the Catholic Church. As I read the chapter, I was amazed by some of the stories. I don't know if you read of the warrior pope. He was my favorite. He'd lead armies into battle. Um, there were cases of people going around selling indulgences. Uh, people coining phrases for sales, such as every time a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. It's a common phrase used by indulgence salesmen. And many of these church leaders were there because they could make lots of money at it. They either inherited the positions, they bought them, the church was in a very corrupt state. Then we get to Martin Luther. He was from this school of Christian humanist. He was taking his religion very seriously. In fact, he was on his way to become a lawyer when one day, in a very terrible lightning storm, he feared for his life, and he promised God that he would quit law and join the priesthood if he'd survive. Sure enough, he kept his word, and he became a monk. Now, as he was a monk, he just wasn't your average ordinary riding it out like a lot of these people I just described. He definitely wasn't your warrior type, although he does get involved in some conflicts, we'll see. But he was very, very anxious as a person. Very unsure of himself and his position in heaven. See, there was quite a deal of disagreement over whether or not a Christian could be sure if they were going to heaven. And Martin Luther struggled with this. To him, that was a real and personal just calamity. Is he going to know what's going to happen? And the Catholic doctrine was that you're fine if you do all of the required things. If you're baptized by the Catholic Church, if you go to confession, if you pay your tithes, if you receive the last rites, they're all to do with traditions. However, Martin Luther's conclusion was that salvation was based on faith alone. And he based this upon his close reading of the Bible. He was particularly upset about the sale of indulgences. Remember, these are the things that you can buy to be forgiven of your sins. He just didn't see where that was written. And so he challenged these things. He challenged them by nailing his complaints to a church door. And this is also where Gutenberg comes into play. See, that little Johann Gutenberg, the little businessman that changed the world. He changed the world in many ways, and the Reformation perhaps wouldn't have even been possible without him. Had somebody not taken that piece of paper that Luther nailed to the door, made thousands of copies, and spread them all throughout Europe. At that point, it was impossible for the church to do damage control. 
This next clip is a scene from the movie Luther, which you can watch later on your own. But in this scene, uh, in a court case, the church threatened Luther with excommunication and even execution if he didn't back down from his statements. In particular, his statements were that salvation was faith alone, that man did not need an necessary between him and God, meaning a priest to pray for him. And that faith, again, faith alone. And the church called him a heretic, challenged him to recant all of these things, and he refused. And it's a pretty powerful scene. So, normally, you say something like that to the most powerful organization in a, on a whole continent, you've never heard of them again. And then I think of the bravery of the boy in the Tiananmen Square in the late 80s in China. I don't know if you've ever seen the picture of the boy who stood in front of the tank. Not just one tank, a column of tanks. It's actually a video, you need to look it up sometime. And then the tanks try to move around him, and he moves to get in front of the tanks. And then the video stops. Nobody ever found the boy. It's true courage. It was during the riots that were suppressed. They tried to turn China into a democracy, not unlike the riots that happened in Syria or Libya, except this was suppressed. It doesn't have a happy ending. That's the story most of the time. We applaud the courage, but it's unfortunate what happened. In this case, however, Luther stood up, and he got away with it. Not only did he get away with it, he changed the world. But how? Well, Luther's fate was supported by several different German princes. Now, for example, some of these German princes were tied to the Catholic Church. This dated all the way back to the time of the Holy Roman Empire, Charlemagne, and so forth. However, some of them did not want to be a part of the Holy Roman Empire, and in a way saw Luther as an opportunity. And so he hopped from castle to castle from various princes that would hide him. And this reformation grew. Luther's followers called themselves Luther and uh, didn't change Christianity entirely. They still believed in the Son of God and the crucifixion and resurrection and so forth. But their priests could get married. They didn't have to be celibate. People did not have to go to confession. They could speak to God directly and they understand. And perhaps most importantly, the Bible was interpreted into the common language. At one time, the Bible was only written in Latin. And only priests, for the most part, could read Latin. Very few common people could read it. However, there were much more, many more, that could read German. And this Reformation spread. The next place I want to talk about is Switzerland. A man named Ulrich Zwingli. Now, under his preaching, his followers called themselves Protestants. Relics and images were abolished, kind of like the schism we talked about the last time we met. The Pope's authority was abolished. And they sought an alliance with Martin Luther. They had some minor disagreements over the nature of the Lord's Supper. For example, Zwingli did not believe that Jesus' actual body became the bread. Just like most Protestants don't practice that today. That's called consubstantiation. Big fancy word for it. They believed that it was a figurative representation of the body and blood. Luther insisted it was the real thing, that the bread magically turns into Jesus' body in a spiritual way, but not physical. Anyway. And um, they sought an alliance with Martin Luther. Aside from that minor disagreement, they agreed on everything else. The Bible was the sole authority for figuring out Christianity. And while, yes, there were lots of theological, intellectual disagreements, I mean, you could take a whole class on theology, you could study it for years. This became vital rather quickly. And lots of blood was shed over the very disagreements about 
a particular religion. Around the same time, the French theologian John Calvin published a book called Institutes of the Christian Religion that incorporated and added to many of Martin Luther's ideas and would later come to exert a powerful influence on many Europeans, including those who settled in New England. Calvin believed very strongly in the inherited sinfulness of mankind and in God's absolute power to rule over human beings. And in predestination, Calvin's belief even before earth, God already knows whether a person will go to heaven or to hell, and that nothing, including living a good life, can influence God's decision. Wherever Calvinism was embraced, which was mainly in France, Switzerland, Germany, and Holland, members of Calvin's Reformed Church tried to wipe out all traces of pagan idolatry they believed had crept into Christianity by smashing religious statues and destroying stained glass windows. But the Calvinist ideal was one of plainness, simplicity, and strict morality in all aspects of life. Calvin. He's the next of these theologians who started a movement that became a denomination of the church and more to it. A highly educated man. Became famous for writing the Institutes of the Christian Religion, perhaps the most exhaustive multi volume work discussing the Christian faith. It's seriously huge. Uh, I had a professor who did his dissertation on part of it. Now, Luther and Calvin agreed on most of the important things, but they disagreed about certain aspects. He emphasized the absolute sovereignty of God, meaning that Calvin believed that everything we ever do has already been decided. This is called predestination. Very complicated. And Calvin also believed that those who would already become Christians and those who would already not become Christians has been decided. And he based that on a close reading of Romans chapter 7. There are still Protestant denominations that feel that way today. But something that he believed that could be considered very radical, was that society should be organized as a theocracy, meaning that the church should rule the state. Does anybody know what it says in the First Amendment to our Constitution about church and state? It should be separate. In fact, the exact wording is that Congress shall make no rules regarding the establishment of a religion or prohibit the practice thereof, meaning the two are separate. Why? Well, we have our history to learn from. And while we sometimes hear the word theocracy and we start thinking of Iran or Saudi Arabia and we start getting a bit nervous, I do anyway. Geneva was actually quite a success. They had schools for priests and missionaries. They were sent out all throughout Europe. Uh, many places converted to Christianity. In fact, some of the first pilgrims to America were Calvinist. Well, what about England? England's story is a little bit different. You know, generally, France went with a group calling themselves the Huguenots, followers of Calvin. Uh, Germany went with Luther. Generally, Italy remained faithful to the Catholic Church and various so on and so forth. England has a totally different story. England's disagreements with the Catholic Church weren't religious in nature. There was a man named Henry VIII who became king of England who was having trouble giving birth to a son. He wanted to divorce his first wife and marry a young woman named Anne Boleyn. He was hopeful that this woman would be able to give him a son. Now, 
science teaches us that it's the male that determines the gender of the baby. I don't think Henry VIII knew that. He kept trying different wives until he would get a son. He kept having daughters. And there was a bit of trouble with this. The, the English court voided his first marriage. And he got married to Anne Boleyn. And she had a daughter. And now the Catholic Church forbade him from any more divorces. They said, okay, that one time, but no more. Guess what? She had a daughter. He wanted to get rid of her. So now, in order to do this, the king has to leave the Catholic Church. And he issued a decree called the Act of Supremacy, saying that the king was the supreme head of the Church of England. Otherwise, they didn't change anything. Still believed the same thing, still did the same thing, etc. Little change in religious practice. However, England is going to move slowly towards Protestantism, which Protestantism, that's the word that means non-Catholic. The root word there is protest. And if you've ever heard the word Bloody Mary, or as a kid, looked in the mirror and said it five times, this is her story, briefly. Uh, when she went, came to power, after Henry VIII, for a brief time, she tried to make England return to Catholicism. And during this time, she burned more than 300 Protestants at the stake, earning the name Bloody Mary. She didn't last too long. Obviously, wasn't very popular. And it was a huge failure, her attempt to make England return to Catholicism. But now let's look at how the Protestant Reformation affected society. Well, for one, the new view of the family. While traditional roles of husband as a leader, wife as submissive, still endured, and really that cult of domesticity still existed, even in the United States, until the mid to late 1800s. Luther's stance on marriage was still very traditional, and I'll quote him for just a moment. The rule remains with the husband, and the wife is compelled to obey him by God's command. He rules the home and the state. He wages war. He defends his possessions, tills the soil. He builds plants, etc. The woman, on the other hand, is like a nail driven into the wall. So the wife should stay at home. And look after the affairs of the household as one who has been deprived of the ability of administering those affairs that are outside and that concern the state. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if that's, you know, it seems offensive that this is how women were viewed, not only in the Middle Ages in the time of the Reformation, but even in the United States. And many people sometimes still hold these beliefs. Anyway, I could talk about that all day. The wife's duties, meanwhile, were to obey her husband in all things. He was considered the head of the household, and she was to bear children and take care of the domestic duties of the home. This Reformation was not just limited to people leaving the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, in fact, looked within itself and realized there were some things that needed to be changed as well. And this was called the Counter-Reformation. And during the Counter-Reformation, for one, uh, the first thing they targeted was called a Reformed Papacy, uh, meaning that they wanted good popes, not warrior popes leading wars, not popes seeking to get rich, uh, not two popes disagreeing and excommunicating each other. That kind of drama doesn't need to happen. And so the Catholic Church founded a society called the Society of Jesus, otherwise known as the Jesuits. Their goals were absolute obedience to the Pope and to seek to educate everyone in the world about Christianity. And these guys were serious, too. In fact, they were some of the very first settlers in the New World. I mean, if you ever watched the old Davy Crockett movie, They All Died at the Alamo at the End. Does anybody know what the Alamo was before it was a fort where Davy Crockett died? Yeah, it was a church. It was a mission. 
was a Jesuit missionary outpost to minister to the Native Americans. These guys were everywhere. Okay, so the effects of this, well, they were quite successful, as the Alamo illustrates. And they were sent to preach all over the world. They even went to China. Now, in terms of the Reformed papacy, Pope Paul III appointed a commission to figure out what the heck was wrong with the church and found out that, A, there were a lot of corrupt leaders and a lot of corrupt policies, too. And so the Council of Trent was held. And during this council, it was to be decided, what is a Catholic? The first thing they did was figure out, oh yeah, we had it right. Reaffirm the church's teachings. Secondly, who is supposed to be allowed to interpret scripture? And again, reaffirm their teachings. Common people aren't educated enough to make religious decisions for themselves, according to the Catholic Church's Council of Trent. Faith and good works are necessary for salvation. Again, this is all to spit in the eye of Martin Luther. And finally, yes, we believe in purgatory. Yes, indulgences. I mean, they were set up by a pope. Popes are the ambassador of Jesus. So if they speak the words of God and call them liars, then <coughs> part of the church's understanding of Christianity is based on tradition. So there's the Bible and church tradition. And that's based on the understanding that the pope speaks the words of God. That in a way, he's like an anointed prophet. It's based on a verse in Luke where Jesus said to Peter, I give you the keys to heaven. And all the popes are considered to be religious descendants of Peter. And in general, the purpose of the Catholic, the, excuse me, of the Council of Trent was to unite the church, to bring them all back together. Now, it's unfortunate that religion leads to bloodshed. You've heard that a million places. Maybe you haven't seen the gory details. France went through a period of time known as the Wars of Religion. The kings of France, loyal to the Catholic Church, attempted to suppress Calvinism and other branches of Protestantism. Meanwhile, French nobles, who were always trying to assert their power over the king, converted to Calvinism. These nobles within the respected parts of France gave the Huguenots, the politicians, excuse me, the Protestants more political power, yet they were vastly outnumbered by Catholics. And this led to 30 years of war, which would not be resolved until the Edict of Nantes. And during this time, after 30 years of bloodshed, 30 years of a religious disagreement, as Vietnam lasted from 64 to 75, nine years. And that's if you count the two after the withdrawal of troops. That's nine years of Vietnam, the longest uh, until Iraq, the longest running war in American history. 30 years for a religious disagreement, seriously. Okay, so what was the resolution? For one, Huguenots were given equal rights. Protestants get to keep their faith. And they can even do political stuff, like hold office. And that's what it took all that bloodshed to figure out. Meanwhile, Europe was divided because of Christianity. The very thing that had united them during the Middle Ages is now tearing them apart. In fact, in some places, they're still divided because of this very thing. I don't know if you watch Sons of Anarchy, but the IRA was the one who always gives them the weapons. The IRA, the Irish Republican Army, they're Catholic, they hate Protestants, they've been doing that for years. Now, meanwhile, Spain was one of the most loyally Catholic nations in all of Europe. Philip II, King of Spain, son and heir to Charles V, hoped to lead Spain into an age of greatness. He inherited 
his father's colonial possessions in the Netherlands and in the Americas. He insisted that his people follow Catholicism strictly. Christopher Columbus landed in America and claimed the land in the name of Spain, and Cortes conquered the Aztecs. They attempted to force the people to become Catholic. And so he hoped to consolidate all the empire. He hoped to be an absolute ruler. Everything was under his direct authority. And this proves extremely difficult. In fact, in the next moments, we'll be talking about the theory of absolutism, of one man trying to rule a whole country by himself. It doesn't work so well, especially when you're dealing with colonies in the Americas, places in the Netherlands, and your own home as a large country. Well, back to England for just a moment. Under the rule of Queen Elizabeth, England became the leader of the Protestant nations. She's still viewed as one of their greatest rulers. And during this time also, England built one of the largest overseas empires with one of the strongest navies in all of Europe. However, she inherited the religious problem stemming from the Reformation, the division between Catholics and Protestants in England. One of the first things she did was get rid of Bloody Mary's influence. She repealed all the Catholic laws saying, you can be Protestant if you want to. And she reaffirmed what Henry VIII had said by saying, I'm the boss of the Church of England. So in England, for a long while, really until the Magna Carta, the king or queen was the boss of the religion. But because England was emerging as a Protestant nation, and because Spain was so hardcore Catholic, this king of Spain, Philip II, thought that if he could just land troops in Spain, all the true Catholics of England would rise up against them, and he would take them without a fight. You know, finally caught up on Game of Thrones, and there was an episode, the very last one they did, uh, the, the woman... Uh, the young queen marches up with her army to the gates and just said, hey, you don't want to be slaves anymore, kill your masters. Sure enough, they thought it was a good idea. They did that, no battle, walked right in. And that's really what Philip II thought he could pull off by simply landing troops. Because, hey, if you don't want to be ruled by Protestants anymore, kill your masters, and we'll have a good old Catholic time. And so he rounds up the largest armada that had ever been assembled up to that time, the famous Spanish Armada. And even though it was huge, it was still too small. For one, they, on the way to England, they had to deal with constant storms that wrecked quite a few of their ships. And they were fighting these smaller English ships with these huge Spanish warships. Smaller English ships ran circles around them outmaneuvered them. Long story short, they never even landed in England. For England's sake, it was pretty awesome. So let's go back to looking at Europe as a whole. Recovering from the bubonic plague we talked about a while back, the population had reached a peak of 85 million. However, it began to decline once again due to Europe's common problems of war, famine, plague, etc., and, of course, all of these terrible things, war, famine, and plague, cause superstition. It's not uncommon that fear causes a superstitious response. It's human nature. I don't know if you've ever truly been afraid. The old saying, there's no atheist in fox holes. We all get a little bit superstitious when we're terrified. Uh, you know, I knew a guy who uh, paddled. Uh, it's a story I heard secondhand. I, I do like to paddle some harder rivers, and this guy was so afraid, whenever he put onto a hard river, he'd urinate on himself, purposely, on his foot, because it tended to work out for him the first time he accidentally did that, and so now he does that every time. It's a weird superstition, but the point is that fear causes irrational behavior. Extreme fear causes some witch burning. <laughs> oh, no. Please work.
but unfortunately we have a lot to cover in a very little amount of time. And so I'd like to point out how we get from that, which is very much a product of the Dark Ages, to modern times. And there are several big social economic factors that we need to look at in a short amount of time. First is a theory known as mercantilism. The idea that the prosperity of a nation depends on the literal amount of gold that nation has. And that a nation can acquire more gold through a favorable balance of trade. And that means that we need to export more stuff than we import. One way to accomplish this is through colonies. If we can get all the raw materials, we need to make stuff from colonies and then make those finished products in country, export those. It's a great way for a country to become wealthy. And so this was kind of the theory behind the whole colonial movement that led to what Africa is today as well as our own Western Hemisphere. Mercantilism in practice. Uh, we ex I explained colonialism. The next is joint stock companies. How are we going to fund all of these colonies? Well, yes, um, King Philip of Spain and, and, excuse me, and his King Ferdinand and his wife Isabella of Spain funded Columbus's expedition. Uh, but not all countries are that wealthy. And in many cases, these expeditions were funded through private corporations called joint stock companies. Okay. All right. So next, as uh, let's go back to this religious trial for just a moment. And uh, I mentioned 30 years of war. This is a different war that lasted for 30 years called the 30 Years War instead of the French Wars of Religion. And the cause of this, yet again, religious. Uh, between France, Spain, Denmark, and Sweden, in competition, yes, for territory, but also over religious disagreements, again, between Protestants and Catholics. Now, this resulted, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, this resulted in a peace agreement known as the Peace of Westphalia. And the reason I wanted to mention this is that a, it was the official end of the Holy Roman Empire. Now we're going to be talking about individual German states, which will eventually be united into a nation. But also, that for the very first time, people in Central Europe were free to choose their own religion. And it took this war to make that happen.
So as we talk about Europe emerging from the Middle Ages to perhaps modern times, one of the big changes we need to look at is in the military. And in many ways, this change is called a military revolution. One of the big changes is, is of course, gunpowder. The use of firearms. The increased use of firearms and cannons makes both castles and armor obsolete. Also, this changes tactics in warfare. Such as in the First World War, we saw Napoleonic tactics used against machine guns. You can't charge frontal assaults at machine guns. It doesn't work. And it took an entire war to figure that out. The Battle of the Somme, 60,000 men dead in one day as the result of a terrible decision to run men frontal assaults. And so we do find these weird, outdated tactics used against modern weapons. There were still knights charging with full suits of armor, and there were still guys that were shooting them with their gunpowder rifles going straight through the armor. However, the effects of this generally, when it sorted itself out, is that now standing armies are going to be necessary because these new weapons require a great deal of money and training to use. And so warfare will get much more expensive. Swords were extremely expensive relative to their time, but nothing in comparison to a cannon. And so princes will have to levy heavier taxes, and governments will become larger to pay for this. War is without a doubt the most expensive thing a society can do. In fact, in my U.S. history class, I was just teaching about the Great Depression. The New Deal represented $30 billion worth of government spending. $30 billion. People called it socialism. Anybody want to guess how much World War II cost? A bit more than $30 billion. Anybody want to? $242 billion. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, just more money than I could possibly imagine. Again, relative to World War II, times, 1940s, I don't even know what that means in today's money. I can tell you we're still paying for it. I can tell you there's no way the government had enough money for that. We borrowed it in the form of war bonds from the American people. Now, I'm a fan of the World War II, and I, my grandparents fought in it, and I think it's something that had to be done. But still, it is without a doubt the most expensive thing we've ever done. Okay, moving on. All right. Briefly, I wanted to show you the theory of absolutism. Now, this theory is later going to come into challenge when we talk about the Enlightenment era, emergence of democracy, and so forth. But this is the idea that rulers used to justify their absolute power first that God put them there. I don't know if you've ever read Romans 13, but it said that rulers were put there by God to punish evil and reward good. Therefore, you must obey your earthly rulers. Paraphrase from Romans 13. And if you don't think that rulers use that to justify their position, oh man. And so these rulers believed that the best way, and even Plato believed, the best way to run a country was through an absolute ruler who was, quote, enlightened. That's how Plato put it anyway. So I wanted to give you kind of, actually your book does this too, uh, two pictures of absolute rulers. You've got Louis XIV, known as the Sun King, seen as the European model of an absolute ruler, and then King Shai of China. Both had this idea of divine authority, although they're coming from different religions. The Chinese called it the... It'll come back to me. The divine mandate, so mandate from heaven. That was it. Okay. And they both ruled absolutely. The Prince is a guidebook for how leaders can gain and keep power. Written in 1532, the book deals with politics at a time when Italian city-states were dominated by ruthless leaders and power struggles. Machiavelli urged rulers to use whatever methods were necessary to achieve their political goals. The prince wasn't based on high ideals, but on the reality Machiavelli saw around him. 
The 26 chapters of The Prince cover everything from how to appear to be compassionate to advice on selecting a political staff. According to Machiavelli, the three main qualities a prince should possess are the abilities to act boldly, to protect his power, and to appear unwavering while being flexible. At certain particular moments, which he calls the founding or refounding of a regime, you will need a leader with exceptional intelligence, with the intelligence of a Lincoln, with the intelligence of a Washington, with the intelligence of a Bonaparte. Machiavelli stressed two sets of attributes for the prince. One um, was very colorful. He used the image of the, of the fox and the lion. The prince must have the ability of the fox to find the snare and the courage of the lion to drive off the wolves. In order to maintain his state, a prince is often forced to act in defiance of good faith, of charity, of kindness, of religion. He should not deviate from what is good, if that is possible, but he should know how to do evil if that is necessary. Machiavelli advised rulers to retain their power by any means necessary, which meant being ruthless, calculating, and unhampered by morality. Many see these lessons as a guide to becoming a tyrant, and many rulers use them this way. Machiavelli is very clear that the end is what counts. He says this in a number of places, and it seems to us a very tough argument. But one man's tyrant is another's fearless leader. Political thinkers from dictators to presidents have read The Prince and taken their own lessons from it. There are certain books which are sufficiently complicated that they have a message for different people in different times because somehow they've touched at an aspect of fundamental human experience. Machiavelli's Prince is a book like that. It deals with an aspect of human life in a very profound way. The central aspect being the role of leaders and why leaders are necessary in any complicated human community. The Renaissance inspired Machiavelli to explore the political world he knew and how an individual leader should act in it. Whether it's a how-to book for tyrants or a realistic portrayal of politics, the prince continues to raise important ethical issues about government and the proper uses of power in the world today. In my high school class, we go into a lot of detail about Machiavelli. I think he's fascinating, uh, but we don't have time, unfortunately. i just like to point out the phrase that they quoted where it says that a, need, a leader needs to know, needs to be good, but know how to do evil when necessary. I think that's food for thought. Consider the atomic bomb. Kill 100,000 people. Second bomb, 100,000 people. Did we do the right thing? In my opinion, absolutely. The land invasion had to be done in the old fashioned way. They estimate it would have killed over a million people. So which is worse, the 100,000 casualties, men, women, and children, or the million people. And Truman had to make that kind of decision. It's not fair that he had to, nobody ever wants to be in that position. But Machiavelli said that was necessary as a ruler. They have to have that ability. Okay, so under Louis XIV, what does an absolute rule look like? For one, he centralized the entire government of France around his palace at Versailles. Place, it's on my list of places to see. It looks awesome, at least from the pictures. Uh, you know, it, I think of like Biltmore on crack. It's huge, beautiful palace. Uh, he removed the power of the nobles, and he made them come live at the palace with him so he could keep an eye on them. He didn't trust anyone under him that had power. It's quite clever, really. Again, it's why he's the number one of these absolute people. Um... Uh, he had complete control over war, church, taxes, foreign policy, you name it. Okay. He did have people under him, however. I mean, you can't run an entire country by yourself, even if you are the absolute ruler. The key is he controlled them as well. His finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, believed that this idea of mercantilism was genius and that the state needed to make sure that the economy was strong. 
subsidized new industries, promoted the growth of monopolies, supported tariffs, uh, used government funds to build roads and canals, etc. But they also, maybe this is to Louis' demise, had a huge standing army. He was almost constantly at war, expanding his kingdom. He had the largest standing army of his day, 100,000 men in peacetime, 400,000 during the war. Waged four different wars during his reign and bankrupted his country because of it. For example, that of the royal family after the time of Louis XIV. Next, what's going on in Germany? Why for this stuff? Uh, Germany, after the Holy Roman Empire dismantled as a result of the Thirty Years' War, was reunited later as a military modern Sparta called Prussia. Built a large standing army, not as large as France's, but these guys were tough and hardcore. And um, the War Commission became the most important governing body in the entire country. These folks lived for war. Frederick the Great, seen here, was one of the greatest revolutionaries of all time. As king of the German state of Prussia in the 1740s, he led an attack on the powerful Austro-Hungarian Empire, capturing the province of Silesia. In 1757, Frederick defended his new territory. He marched his army 200 miles in 16 days to fight Austrian soldiers near the town of Leuten on the Polish border. Outnumbered two to one, Frederick used a tactic that became his hallmark. He marched the Prussian soldiers toward the Austrian front, then wheeled them to the right under the cover of low hills. They reappeared suddenly to the left of the Austrian army, which was being hammered by Prussian artillery. The Austrians were crushed. From the Sanssouci Palace near Berlin, Germany, Frederick ruled his growing kingdom. The army he'd created was unmatched by any in Europe. Its secret was drill. Today, drill seems purely ceremonial. But men who could march precisely in time and change direction and speed as one on the parade ground could do so in battle. And on the 18th century battlefield, Drill meant the difference between life and death. At Leuten, Frederick had his troops change direction while hidden from the Austrians, then reappear where least expected. The drill practiced by Frederick is still used today. Frederick's tactics at Leuten were a masterpiece of precise battlefield maneuvering, but they were achieved at a cost. The tactics of 18th century gunpowder armies required men to perform drill in a very rigid and methodical way, and in a sense they had to be beaten into it. There's a famous phrase of Frederick's that uh, the men must be more frightened of their officers than they are of the enemy. And I think Friedrichian discipline was very severe indeed. He did literally uh, flog his army. With his ruthlessly disciplined army, Frederick took over Austria, Sweden, Russia, and France. Prussian aggression gave Britain the opportunity to attack her arch-rival, France. Britain joined the war on Prussia's side. A conflict that began in Europe now has spread worldwide. It would last seven long years. The Seven Years' War 1756 to 63 is often described as the First World War, um, and it became one 
I think for two reasons. One was that uh, the combatants, Britain and France particularly, had large enough fleets to project power to great distances. The sailing warship having become an enormously powerful instrument of strategic outreach. Around the globe, on land, but most often at sea, wherever the British and French met each other, they fought. The key weapon was the warship. Equipped with cannon, it was the single most costly, powerful, and advanced weapon system of its day. These were floating fortresses. A single warship carried as much firepower as an entire army. Sea battles raged off India, Africa, and the Americas. But it was a dangerous game for the French. In a single year, the British captured 6,000 French sailors and 300 trading vessels. French ships were being sunk faster than France could build them. And they were expensive. In this long war of attrition, the ability to pay for new ships was almost as important as the battles themselves. Here, Britain had the advantage. As an island nation, almost its entire defense budget was spent on its navy. In addition, Britain also happened to be the wealthiest and most successful trading nation in Europe. By the mid-18th century, the British Royal Navy had built over 300 warships, worth two and a half billion dollars at today's prices. The French, with a large and costly land army to support, could simply not compete. The more ships Britain made, the more powerful it became. Protecting trading interests, fighting off rivals, and claiming more colonies. British sea power was a partnership between government and business. The Bank of England was founded in 1694 to fund a war with the Dutch. In the Seven Years' War, France could not match the British ability to raise loans for the arms race. The British Navy won victory after victory over the French. By the end of the Seven Years' War, Britain had overwhelmed the French Navy. The global war that Prussia started left Britain ruling the waves, poised to build an empire that would cover a quarter of the globe. And so, again, with our theory of absolutism, two more examples. Austria and Russia. Austria is really uh, very similar to Germany. That's ethnic Germans lived there. They joined with the Nazis because they were ethnic Germans during the Second World War. Uh, however, they were a very large independent empire. In fact, before they were a country, Austria was the collected territory of the Habsburg dynasty. One family owned the country of Austria, effectively. That was the Habsburgs. Back to Russia. Now, Russia, if you've ever wondered why they, um, at least historically, were a backward nation, and then experienced communism with the Cold War and the Soviet Union and so forth, what, it, you know, the best short explanation I can give you is, well, they were conquered by the Mongols. And they were built by the Mongols longer than any other place. Ivan the Terrible, uh, they call him Ivan the Great, did not 
free Russia from the Mongol grip until 1300. They were the last bastion of the Mongols. I think I've mentioned them a few times in here. But after Ivan, the greatest leader of Russia is known as Peter the Great. That's the Great. Uh, wanted to make Russia modern. That was his hope. They were all seen as backward. They weren't even really viewed as European. I mean, East, uh, Western Russians, certainly European. Eastern Russians are more Asian than they are European. And so he wanted to unify his country. So he did some strange things. Uh, for one, well, he did some practical things. Uh, he needed a warm water port for his navy. He built a new city, called it St. Petersburg after himself, uh, so he could build a navy there. Uh, divided Russia into provinces, required that all Russians speak Russian. And then finally, uh, he made Russians pay a, a tax for having beards. I think it's kind of fun. I like growing a beard every now and then. And uh, I just think it's funny to point out that he was trying to make Russians look European. And Europeans were shaving at this time, and so he wanted to make sure his people shaved. So. Look it up. Okay. Uh, we're getting down towards the end. Um, moving on back to England. Um, England was one of the very first countries to reject their absolute rulers. Uh, and the two people you need to know about here are James I and Charles I. Uh, both tried to assert this theory of divine right that God put them there. Um, both tried to force the Protestants to accept their religious policies. And again, if you know anything we know about religion, it's that you can't make people believe anything, no matter how hard you try. Okay. And so this caused a civil war, Dan. A terrible civil war, in which Charles I was executed. They cut his head off. And for a time, a Protestant Puritan leader became the dictator of England during the Civil War. Charles I, excuse me, Oliver Cromwell, became absolute dictator and hoped to create a theocracy in England. 
And then there was a time known as the Glorious Revolution. After Oliver Cromwell passed, Charles II, Charles I's son, came back to power and suspended the laws that had been passed against Catholics and Puritans. And so, again, trying to decree religious toleration. And then after him, a man named James II tried to make England become Catholic again. That didn't work, long story short. And then finally, uh, King William and Mary created the very first beginnings of a democracy. When they accepted the throne, after all the drama that England had gone through that I've summarized in one minute, it was a terrible time for England. They accepted the throne with certain conditions. This is the very first time that these formerly absolute rulers had to play by the rules. And this is called a constitutional monarchy. In the meantime, back in England during the early 1640s, insurrection brewing. And this man, a Puritan named Oliver Cromwell, was about to play a leading role in what would soon erupt into a full-blown civil war. Cromwell was a Puritan whose beliefs had been fostered inside the walls of Sydney Sussex College here at the University of Cambridge. For this particular college was a stronghold of Puritanism during his student years. During the first part of the Civil War, Cromwell lived in this house in the town of Ely, not far from Cambridge. And no doubt its kitchen was a good place for him to think over the difficult problems that confronted him, until his duties as a military leader finally took him away. Cromwell's parliamentary forces captured London and its royal fortress early in the war. So for four years' time, the court of the king was based here at Oxford, where strong support existed both for the monarchy and the established Church of England. But eventually, in 1649, King Charles was tried for treason, sentenced to death, and then beheaded. Thereafter, the monarchy was abolished, and Oliver Cromwell, a Puritan, assumed the title of Lord Protector and ruled over England for five years' time. Okay, and so we're almost done. I just want to briefly talk about our culture and literature during this time. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an art historian, so I'm not terribly qualified, so I'll be brief. Uh, but a new style of art began in Italy called Baroque, and the idea with it was, well, A, to impress people. It's very beautiful. Uh, but also... Uh, to use dramatic effects to arouse emotion. It's very dramatic. I would assume this is commissioned by uh, some extremely wealthy person and here to emphasize the extravagance of these people. Uh, but these bodies, just a few points about this painting, are in violent motion. They're large. They're you know, larger people and they're new. Uh, one other thing, and your book points this out, is a dramatic use of light and shadow. But again, unfortunately, I don't know enough about it to really speak to it too much. Um, another style was emerging in many Dutch countries, and that's realism. Uh, portraits, landscapes, real objects, etc. Realistic portraits of everyday life. And so while this is very glorified and glamorous, I don't know if these are angels or what they're supposed to be. Uh, and then you've got some flowy angel here playing a trumpet. And so these people must, maybe this is Queen Elizabeth, I'm not sure. But um, whereas this school of Dutch realism, here's a great example. This is called the wedding couple. So it's meant to portray ordinary people. So instead of the angels coming out of heaven, you know, singing hallelujah, she's pregnant, and they're getting married. That's real life. And, of course, Shakespeare for a moment. Uh, Shakespeare was a man of the theater. He was a playwright, and he traveled with an acting troupe. And their home base was the Globe Theater in London. 
Uh, of course, if you haven't read his stuff, at least read some of it. At least watch some of the movies. I mean, it's pretty incredible stuff. Uh, I'm not going to start quoting Shakespeare up here for you. Uh, but his, his plays exhibit just a remarkable understanding of the human condition. You know, read Ham Hamlet's soliloquy, to be or not to be, sometime. You know, read some excerpts of Romeo and Juliet, pretty amazing stuff. You know, read some quotes from Macbeth sometime. You know, he just seems to have this remarkable understanding. And so he, in the English language, is quoted more than any other author, second only to the Bible. I think that's kind of neat. This is the only surviving portrait of Shakespeare which has a real claim to being authentic. He is probably in his late thirties here. We don't know what he did with himself in the early years in London. If the sonnets he wrote are anything to go by, he had at least one major love affair, if not more, which would deepen his experience of life. But the details are unclear. By 1592, he had joined up with the Actors' Company of Lord Strange. Fernando Stanley Baron Strange, like other rich aristocrats, maintained a group of players and writers who performed to the public and sometimes at court. Edward Allen was the leading actor of the company and no doubt a considerable influence on Shakespeare as he was reckoned to be the best actor of his day. Shakespeare's first play, A History of Henry VI, was written for this company and it was at once a commercial success, considered to be at least as good as the work of Christopher Marlowe. Educated at Cambridge University and of Shakespeare's age, Marlowe was already well established as a playwright and would have without doubt been Shakespeare's literary rival for years to come had he not been killed in a fight only a year later. More important for Shakespeare's development was Henry Risley, Earl of Southampton. Shakespeare dedicated his poem Venus and Adonis to Southampton, then 19 years old. He was wealthy, handsome, popular at court, and so a very suitable patron for Shakespeare. A second dedication with the poem The Rape of Lucrece followed approximately a year later. Lucrece To the Right Honourable Henry Risley, Earl of Southampton and Baron of Titchfield. The love I dedicate to your lordship is without end, whereof this pamphlet, without beginning, is but a superfluous moiety. The warrant I have of your honourable disposition, not the worth of my untutored lines, makes it assured of acceptance. It continues in this to our ears rather exaggerated vein. The Earl is believed to have paid Shakespeare one thousand pounds for the poems, so the flattery of the dedication was perhaps worth while. Becoming known in the right circles as a poet was obviously important, but it was in the theatres that Shakespeare's career took off. The theatres were on the south bank, across the bridge and away from the city. As always, the authorities frowned on theatres as riotous and anti-establishment places, so they were kept as far away as possible from the city. The buildings were tall and open to the skies because, of course, there was no stage lighting. Performances took place in the afternoon. This contemporary drawing shows the layout of a stage. There were no curtains except at the back. The audience stood around the central platform or sat in the galleries, and of course all classes of people attended. The theatre was a popular place of entertainment, not for the rich only. This is the new Globe Theatre in London, on the site of the original. 
The details obviously varied from theatre to theatre, but generally there was an upper balcony for the musicians and sometimes for the actors, if the play called for it, and doors at the back of the stage, which were used as the action required. Essentially, the audience was close to the actors. There was no scenery, and the action moved forward swiftly, changing scenes from battlefield to inner chamber with no difficulty. The writer had to convey it all in the brilliance of his dialogue, and of course, music and sound effects played an important part. Nearby, in a similar building, was housed the bear baiting, a cruel spectacle much enjoyed. Further along the bank, another theatre, the Swan, follows the same pattern as the Globe. When Shakespeare arrived in London, there were four theatres. By the end of his life, there were twelve. By 1595, Shakespeare owned a share in his theatre company, which had changed its name to the Lord Chamberlain's Men on the death of Lord Strange. By 1599, he had bought a tenth share of the new Globe Theatre. The other actors in the company, or as well as writing Shakespeare performed as an actor, included Richard Burbage, for whom Shakespeare created parts. He was the first Hamlet. Shakespeare himself played the ghost of Hamlet's father. This is Nathaniel Field, also a member of the company. Actors joined as boys to play the women's parts, so the theatre was their whole life.